Hi, I am Professor Goodmanson. This video is intended for my students in my aircraft design class at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where I currently teach. The video presents excerpts from my textbook, General Aviation Aircraft Design, Applied Methods and Procedures. Its purpose is to supplement my class lectures. The book is available online from a large number of outlets, for instance Elsevier and Amazon. It is recommended for anyone interested in the design of general aviation aircraft. The purpose of this video is to make you aware of common pitfalls in aircraft drag analysis. I have now taught aircraft design at the university level for six years and boy you would be surprised to know in how many ways drag analysis can go wrong. For the record I'm not just referring to my students. Rest assured their final work is free of such mistakes. However, I often see serious blunders made in capstone design reports written by students from all sorts of academic institutions, well known and not so well known. You will see a few of these traps shortly and learn how to avoid them. Drag analysis is a serious topic for anyone pursuing career in aircraft design, performance analysis, flight testing, wind tunnel testing, stability and control and others. Its findings can make or break an aircraft development project. This means a lot of people may depend on you completing your work correctly. If you're a student or someone who either teaches or, in some way, relies on drag analysis, this video is intended for you. It is vital to understand that it is impossible to fix a problem one doesn't acknowledge exists. This is an important point because it is as easy to underpredict drag as it is to overpredict it. What is hard? is to predict it accurately. The first step in accurate prediction is to acknowledge that one can make mistakes. This encourages one to check one's work. If your drag is underestimated, your performance analyses will make it seem your aircraft flies faster and farther at a given fuel consumption than it actually will. It will also make it seem it flies faster and farther than rival aircraft of similar size and power plant, and that should raise a big red flag. When your customers discover this, and they will, you and the company for which you work are in big trouble. If you're lucky, it will only require a lot of money and time spent on a drag reduction program to try and make the aircraft meet the bogus performance goals sold to the customer. At worst, there is a potential for the company to be sued out of existence on the basis of customer deception. In contrast, if you overpredict the drag, a perfectly viable aircraft may appear to possess the flying qualities of a slug and be cancelled during the conceptual phase regardless of its true potential. I could give you oodles of examples of both, but I won't because I want to keep this video short so that you will bother to watch it to the end. The drag of the airplane is not, I repeat not, the same as the drag of the airfoil. This error surfaces with surprising frequency, but frankly I do not blame it on the students but their instructors. Yes, yes, I know, the drag of the airfoil contributes in an important way to the total drag of the airplane and all that, but that's it. Of course it would be lovely if we could just open up an airfoil catalog to find the drag coefficient for our airplane. But rest assured, our lives are much, much more complicated than that. I have seen more than one capstone design project for which the drag of the airfoil was used to represent the drag of the complete aircraft. This is disturbingly wrong. It is like asserting that the weight of a wing rib represents the empty weight of the aircraft. The drag coefficient of the airplane as a whole is always, always greater than that of the airfoil. Luckily, the fix is simple. Don't make this mistake. This is a drag polar. It shows how the total drag coefficient changes with the lift coefficient. Recall that when the lift coefficient is low, the angle of attack is low. When the lift coefficient is high, the angle of attack is high. For performance analysis work, it is crucial to represent this behavior accurately using the appropriate mathematics. A drag polar can be established using a number of methods which fall into two classes, post-diction and pre-diction. Post-diction methods offer the highest accuracy because the drag polar is obtained from wind tunnel or flight testing. However, the accuracy comes at great cost because it requires a physical specimen of the aircraft to be fabricated first. This renders them inapplicable for conceptual design work, forcing us to resort to prediction methods. 
these do not cost too much to apply unless we make mistakes, as I stated earlier. Commonly, two methods are used to model the drag puller. I call them the simplified and adjusted drag models in my book. Note that more sophisticated methods exist, although I will not discuss them here. I strongly advise against the use of the simplified drag model and only permit my students to use the adjusted one. This is not to say the simplified model doesn't have some advantages, it does. For instance, its mathematical simplicity makes it ideal for explaining complex concepts in performance theory. The simplified drag model assumes that the minimum drag is experienced when the lift coefficient is zero. This assumption is only valid for geometry such as symmetrical airfoils, and for selected aircraft, for instance the Bell X-1 has its minimum drag coefficient close to a zero lift coefficient. However, for this airfoil, and this airfoil, and this plane, and this plane, and all of these planes, this assumption doesn't hold. The minimum drag occurs at non-zero lift coefficient for all of them. But what's the big deal, you ask? Well, this is the big deal. Here you see actual wind tunnel data for a real aircraft. If we try to model this data using the simplified model, you see the predicted matches the test data for only one lift coefficient. However, if we use the adjusted model, the improvement of the prediction is excellent, provided the lift coefficient is not too high. What is very disconcerting is the resulting lift to drag ratio. Look. In this case, the simplified model predicts the maximum lift-to-drag ratio of approximately 14, the adjusted, 20. We have already seen that the adjusted model agrees much better with the experimental data. The implication is that, again in this case, the simplified model would make it appear our airplane has 43% shorter range than its true potential. Since range is a performance parameter that sells airplanes, we might conclude the airplane's anemic range renders it not worthy of being developed. The fix? Never use anything inferior to the adjusted drag model. If you're an instructor, insist on its use by your students. The third trap involves the prediction of drag at high angles of attack. We saw in trap 2 that the drag prediction suffers at high angles of attack. Both the simplified and adjusted drag models do very poorly at high lift coefficients. This sharp rise in drag is due to sharp growth in flow separation, and the quadratic model used for the drag modeling simply can't keep up with this increase. This leads to very poor low speed performance predictions. For instance, look at this. The adjusted model indicates the minimum level airspeed is way below the stalling speed. This represents an impossible scenario. The fix? My book offers an easy-to-use correction that creates a spline that is used when the lift coefficient exceeds a certain value. The method generates a smooth transition between the two curves. Below that value, use the adjusted drag model. Above, the spline. You can see the previous drag polar here before and after. Here is the resulting lift-to-drag ratio as function of lift coefficient before and after. And here is the effect on the power map before and after. You can see that this moves the theoretical minimum airspeed much closer to the stalling speed, improving low speed performance predictions. The fourth trap is the tendency to omit less prominent drag sources, for instance antennas, fairings, inlets, exhaust stacks and such. In my book I present an excellent historical example of this obtained from a 1940s NACA wartime report. The report details the drag investigation of 11 military aircraft that didn't meet the performance that had been promised. The aircraft were stripped to a clean configuration by gradually removing components and the drag coefficient was measured in a wind tunnel after each removal. You see the results here for the Seversky P-35 fighter aircraft. Using the methods in my book I have calculated the maximum airspeed for each configuration to give you a better idea as to what the cost of carelessness is. The streamlined first version has a minimum drag coefficient close to 166 drag counts and with the standard engine should have been capable of 296 knots true at 12,000 feet. But look at how each change increases the minimum drag coefficient and reduces the top speed. The 18th and final version, the most realistic version, reveals the minimum drag coefficient is 67% greater than the first version. The first version 
could have been the aircraft analyzed by the designers. The maximum airspeed of this last version is merely 252 knots true rather than 296 knots, a difference of 44 knots. How realistic is the aircraft you've just analyzed? Is it like the first one? Or realistic like the last one? This is the NACA 65415 airfoil. This is its drag polar. What is of interest here is the shape here, which we call a drag bucket. Over this range of lift coefficients, the boundary layer is laminar, from the leading edge as far back as 65% of the airfoil's cord length on the upper surface, and 90% of the lower one. Since laminar skin friction is about four times less than turbulent friction, the result is the substantial reduction in drag. But you have to recognize that sustaining laminar boundary layer is very hard and it requires expensive, high-quality surfaces to achieve. Even so, dedicated natural laminar flow airfoils can easily become turbulent due to the accumulation of dead bugs on the leading edges or skin waviness. But how does one treat boundary layers that are partially laminar and partially turbulent? I suggest you use the mixed boundary layer theory I present in my book. There is strong argument that suggests that most aircraft wings with smooth skin leading edges will sustain laminar boundary layer a short distance. As soon as this boundary layer flows over plate joints or hits the first row of rivets, this quickly destabilizes and becomes turbulent. Of course, smooth composite wing surfaces will sustain it as far aft as 55 to 75 percent, depending on the airfoil. However, don't expect to see a drag bucket in your drag polar for a complete aircraft. The drag of the rest of the airplane usually masks the drag bucket. This even holds for most sailplanes, although some are clean enough to feed you rudimentary signs of a drag bucket in their drag polars. The final trap presented here has to do with sanity checks. You are obligated to calculate a realistic drag coefficient for your aircraft, and you must convince yourself it is so. This work is not completed unless you include a comparison of similar aircraft. If you're an instructor, never accept drag estimates by your students unless they report the minimum drag coefficients for at least four to five similar aircraft. If the students who fell into trap one had done this, chances are they would have figured it out that they were way off. My book should be very helpful to you in this capacity because it not only provides a large table of minimum drag coefficients for various classes of aircraft that you can compare your results to, it also provides you with methods to extract this important coefficient for other aircraft using performance data in the public domain. To the question, for the adjusted drag model how does one predict the minimum drag coefficient? Oswald span efficiency and lift coefficient of minimum drag for a brand new aircraft. Methods for this are provided in chapters 9 and 15 in the book. The final question presented here is, what is acceptable accuracy of prediction? Plus or minus 5% accuracy for an SR-22 style aircraft and whose drag coefficient is calculated in my book means plus or minus 13 drag counts of the actual CD min. For a propeller-driven trainer, it means plus or minus 16 drag counts. For a commercial jetliner or a jet fighter, it means approximately plus or minus 10 drag counts. And for a sailplane, it means plus or minus 5 drag counts. I hope this video has shed a little light on common mistakes when performing drag analysis and how to avoid them. If it has helped you in some way, I hope you'll consider giving it a thumbs up rating on YouTube. Have fun designing!